Hey, uh, Mr. Ermichold, uh, welcome to Rotterdam. Thank welcome you. to the Rotterdam Film Festival. Thank you. Hey, before we start, uh, I would like to do a little, how do you say it, santé, a little toast to Mr. Rutger Wolfson, who is not here. And we should have been here. And uh, I think we share a friendship to this particular man, so we miss him. So before we start our conversation, let's drink to Mr. Wolfson. <laughs> Uh, you will look at it. Mm -hmm. Hopefully Boston. he will look yes. at it. Hopefully <laughs> we look at it. Hey, this, uh, the two things which are hardly coincidental. First, uh, this festival has, a, you could say, a large portion of your oeuvre, although I was cut out of it. Poor, yeah, I'm sorry for this. Uh, you know, I was asked to to become part of uh, this presentation, but we arrived too late because for some odd reason the taxi driver had thought that we would start a bit later. So I'm, I'm a little bit in the dark and I have to follow this man's lead in some ways. Um, well, anyway, that's one thing. Um, but it's of course not for nothing that your work has been so largely represented in this particular festival because it's, it, you could say the thematic approach of this particular one is Europe. Huh? And uh, when I saw your films, and uh, funny enough, of course, one was completely dedicated to the States and the other one was, you could say, into the heart of darkness, I was thinking, how would you perceive the fact that, you know, your oeuvre is now presented within the context of Europe? Well, I'm definitely a European and a German, and so, but of course, as a German, I have the tendency to run away and go into the world and look at how uh, things are structured in other parts of the world and and you know we know that the last century was totally destructive to a lot of people a lot of humans and a lot of constructions and uh, the last film we saw today d'annunzio is a k kind of example how it built up this kind of destruction because by by, by a overflowing decadence of uh, stealing art, collecting art, stealing it, making a lifestyle out of it without uh, a certain background to it. So I put in this film, as you mentioned, as a contrast, the writing of Joseph Conrad, who was very aware of colonialistic uh, European approaches to other parts of the world. Could you so tell us a little bit about D'Annunzio? Because uh, I know he's an Italian poet yes. and there it stops. Oh. Uh, D'Annunzio was an Italian writer who uh, at the Fien de Circle and he was very famous for his novels and then he became a political activist before the, uh, in, the sec in the First World War and defended uh, the uh, uh, Italian s the state against uh, Austrian German uh, uh, war uh, partners, so to say. For so my that belief, he's this whole set yeah, what he is deeply part of this European history of of course war yes, and destruction. And yeah. Of course, and and he actually founded some kind of. Uh, 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 this whole idea of founding political groups and military groups was he even designed the uniforms of the soldiers in, in parts Ooh. of his uh, uh, regiments in the First World War. He designed like political propaganda. He was always, it was always shimmering between the the left and the uh, and the right, so he was a forerunner of Mussolini. Mo Mussolini admired him. Mm. I didn't admire it work, his work at all. It's one of the films, one of the very few films about uh, artists or writers or architects that uh, I really despise. So it's a kind of hate film, what you just saw. Well, uh, well, I think we saw it. I mean, it, it uh, was as if, if you tried to cleanse those rooms through your camera. It was, uh, yeah. yeah, and it ends up with this uh, 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 
religious cleansing process. Uh, this song by Brian Eno and David Byrne, who is uh, that's about like uh, uh, religion. So, for me, it's a ritual to get rid of it. I must say, and uh, uh, this was my motive to do the film. So when you talk about Europe, it's a very complicated issue because, of course, we know that Europe has a hard, uh, a hard uh, tradition and racism and colonialism and so on. So we have to deal with that. And when you said, well, you basically a lot of films of yours are acted out in the United States. You are right, because I'm always into the uh, uh, relationship between, between these Western cultures, the United States, Europe, and then back again. And in architecture, you see a lot of influences going back and forth. So we cannot only talk about Europe, I'm sorry. <laughs> I wouldn't dare. I wouldn't dare. Okay, so let's go back to another story. I think a truly, truly European story, and one, of course, which is also woven into most of your films. This is a story of modernism, which, of course, is played out yes. through you by, yes. well, maybe first and foremost by buildings, even more than architects. Mm. Should we go back to those? Yeah. Yeah, and basically it's the founding fathers of modernism yes. that okay. I'm referring to. And some of them are not so well known as now the, their, their follower, uh, like Robert Maillard, Adolf Loos, Louis Sullivan, Rudolf Schindler. Uh, well, Perret not even, yeah. you as know. Hmm? Teacher of Corbusier, the Perret. Yes, yeah. Perret, Auguste um, Perret, of yeah. course, Pierre Lucinervi. Everybody n knows a little bit about them, but this cataloging their works was very essential to my idea of getting a new approach to their work. So, because everybody knows from uh, architectural lexica, uh, lex uh, 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 lexica or school books, who are they and who they are but nobody really knows their work, so I thought it's a necessity to do these films. And I wondered when I did started to do that, or in the middle of it, of the process, that there weren't these films. I thought it's such a simple idea to do that, and there must be 100,000 films like that, but there were none. Nothing. And this is really tells you something about the state of affairs, how history of architecture gets uh, documented and so on. You cannot only do that by writing and textbooks. You have to document the spaces. And that is why I use cinema spaces to do that, because there you can have the experience to be within these spaces. But funny enough, your relationships in between architecture and film, which is considered to be almost, you could say, an ideal relationship, because finally we have a medium which reveals the notion of space. You seem to complicate that at the same time, because you're... How do I do that? I don't know. You're a mean man. That's the whole point, I think, because oh. you come so close sometimes to the walls and the textures. You seem to... How do you say, almost well, dissolve the notion of space once in a while? Well, I think what I don't do is to idolize these spaces. Mm -hmm. And what I don't do, I don't represent them in a kind of official way. I move into these spaces and uh, a lot of uh, uh, shots add up to a final image, and it's not the one representative image that you can find in architectural Could photography. Could you suggest that, say, say, what you're trying to reveal is not so much formalistic, but much more, well, for instance, psychological? It's a very subjective approach. It's mm. somebody who walks through these buildings and experiences uh, the buildings so that the onlookers or the audience can do the same. And it's not an ideological approach where you say this is important and this is not like in BBC documentaries or the History Channel where there's always somebody who says what's important and what not. No, I want you to be in a position to experience it yourself. 
This, of course, might be new, but I think my audience is totally intelligent, and I don't think it's stupid like a lot of filmmakers think <laughs> the audience <laughs> is. Yeah. Is, that, is that a longing or...? A longing? No. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'm the audience too, yes, and yes. I don't... Uh, when I sit in a film where somebody wants to tell me what is right and what is wrong, I think, well, shut up, and I know myself what's going on, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not a teacher in these films. I'm somebody who pre represents, who, who gives you the possibility to experience these spaces yourself. Mm. And I'm longing for that somebody else continues this work because I can't. No, but I, I uh, completely agree with you that, funny enough, architecture, which, you know, when it deals with exhibition and so on and so on, always has to deal with the fact that the building is not there, you know? Yes. But for some odd reason, they hardly dare, you know, to embrace, for instance, in the same way as you do, this medium of film, in order to come up with, uh, well, something which is more evocative, I would say, than formalistic, you know? Uh, and it was very interesting. I did this. I do this now for 20 years, and it was very in, the, uh, in, in this time the internet evolved, mm -hmm. and 92, so you yeah. could until let's say the 80s or so. Documentary film was something like uh, the um, the art that had to include everything, like speech and music and explanation and writing and and to give the whole picture of the world. And now I can say, well, go onto the internet, find out the facts that are written down, and then come to see the film and experience the spaces, non-interrupted yes. by the other means yeah. of communication. And I found that was... Uh, so in a way, I could go back to the history of film when it started 100 years ago, it was their documentary film to show other people how, w how the world looked somewhere else. They were not able to travel mm -hmm. so much. And now I, I go back to very simple means to represent these spaces. And, uh, and that turned during, in the beginning, when I started to do this work, like 20 years, people thought I'm crazy because I said, there's no talk in it, why we can't. Well, TV stations would say, we, we cannot broadcast it, we can only broadcast something where somebody says something because there's so-called silence in it, and well... Well, there's hardly any narrative. Uh, being the, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, the last film we saw today is full of speech, like computerized speech, yeah. but that is really not very... Uh, uh, regular regular for films. my yeah. films. But uh, then after a while, it turned out that it, these films were a kind of means of um, contemplating architecture. For example, these films about Schindler are like, let's like say, Perret, and they had runs in cinemas for eight weeks or so, hmm. because so many people came to, to get the experience of architecture. So I, I thought... Uh, I'm on the right track to do that, yeah. Well, well you, I think at, at, at this very moment, uh, architecture is still dealing with, uh, well, you could say huge difficulties of how to represent our own medium. And I think yes. one of, yeah, yeah, the way you enter this discipline is quite radical, I must say. Well, one of the things which, of course, stands out is, is, is your fascination for the interior. Huh? Mm -hmm. Could you reveal a little bit more about this? Um. Well, there's the outside and the inside. You want, when you see something from the outside and uh, you imagine <laughs> what could be inside, you have to see it. And if you, if you're, I'm interested in complicated spaces, like the mo most modern architects are too, ah, like yeah. Lowe's, for example. When you see a Lowe's building from the outside, it looks like a temple of GR geometry when you go inside it gets mm -hmm. really complicated and I do always the camera of myself of my films in my films so as, as a cinema photographer I, I'm my idea is the complicated space and translate a complicated space into two-dimensional imagery 
and this is where I'm good at. I could never build a building. I'm not good in three-dimensional things. So I, uh, so but I think I like to grab the space and put it onto the picture plane, and this is my work. Yeah. And this is what I enjoy when I. I, if we discuss, say, this classic relationship between the inside and the outside, mm. eh? and, and, and I remember one of the sentences you ever said in an interview, like, you know, uh, every interior, of course, makes a, well, almost a description or also a speech about the outside. You, can, you know, you cannot extrapolate one from the other. But if you discuss, say, interior at this very moment, eh? The idea of a cave is almost pis impossible. Eh? The digital culture opened up, yeah. you could say, the interior mm. and has made it, well, an exterior almost. And of course, the modern architecture always worked with a barrier between interior and exterior and made it transparent. But, uh, and that's very interesting because usually the inside of a building is kind of, kind of model of the brain on memory and everything. And so when you go into it, you can actually see the, uh, the work, the brain of the architect working, how he worked on the space, how he worked on, uh, or she, how they work on uh, 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 what's there, and you can actually read their mind. That's why I call this part of my film series but do you uh, think autobiography. Uh, like autobiographies, they don't they don't write their autobiographies; they build them. But do you think that's still possible? Because in, in, in you know, especially of course with people like Lowe's, there is still the possibility yeah. of an interior. Mm. With you know the current mm. architectural practice, we talk about cladding, we talk about a skin, uh, but the interior has completely dissolved for a notion of flexibility. Is your idea? of autobiography, yeah, which reveals itself through the spatial construction. Is that still possible nowadays? I think I, it, uh, it would be possible, and there are still some architects who compose that these kind of spaces, because do you want to live in an open space? Maybe you want, because you're moft. an ex exhibitionist <laughs> or yeah. something. But uh, usually there is a need to have a space of concentration to something, or to an inside where you can rest and you're, you don't live in a museum that's open space or something. Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe you do, but uh, I, I do not long to do that. So I, I'm, and I'm into construction. I mean, I'm not dealing only with architects, no. but only with civil engineers who do large constructions like halls, or that have a certain function, or bridge, a bridge has a certain function, and you can, when you, when you, uh, when you design it, when you, uh, uh, when you build it, you have to have a special idea of how to design it, and there are so many uh, uh, possibilities, and there are good ones, and there are bad ones, and when you see bridges by Robert Maillard that had so many, influenced so many bridge builders, it's a delightful thing to work on this yes. kind of thing. There's a, I didn't see it, so I have to only ask you to reveal me something a bit about a film which premiered at this particular festival. And this is, of course, a story of, you could say, one building in two variations. Could you say that a little bit about this film? Building? And some of them saw, saw the film called Two Museum. And yeah, it's, uh, it's a film, uh, Samuel Bickles, uh, an architect who lived in uh, Palestine and Israel. He actually went to Palestine in the 20s and built the, for the, for the left-wing kibbutz, socialist kibbutzes, he, he, he built the uh, communal parts like sleeping rooms and dining rooms and museums and so on. And in 1948, he built a museum of art in En Harod in North Israel. Uh, actually, that kibbutz didn't want it to be a part of Israel because they had their own uh, a ah. way of dealing with the neighborhoods, but they were forced to be a part of Israel then. And that building has a very special uh, light cons construction dealing with daylight. So in 1986, 
Dominique de Menil in Houston, Texas, wanted to build a, a museum for her very large art collection. She's one of the uh, richest uh, uh, art sponsors in Texas, she was. And she asked Renzo Piano to design that building. And Renzo Piano, up to then, had only built the Centre Pompidou, Pompidou. in mm. uh, Paris. And she said to him, I want daylight and not artificial light in my museum. Mm. A special way, so the art should be lighted by daylight. And Renzo Piano said to her that he doesn't know how to deal with it because uh, he only built that black box, the uh, Centre yes. Pompidou. So she sent him to... Uh, and I brought to, to yeah. Samuel Bickle's building because she knew it. And so it's a kind of replica of the lighting system in the, in the uh, De Menil Museum in Houston, Texas, that was erected in 1986. So my film, Two Museum, deals with a forerunner and an example, and then somebody made something out of it. I think that was an interesting process to look at both museums. I came about it by accident because I was in Ann Arbor and thought, well, somehow I remember this building. Could it be that there is... And then I remembered I was in Houston, ah. Texas in 89, and then the curator, Galia Baor in uh, Ann Arbor said, well, there is a history of that building because uh, they came here to look at our museum and uh, to take it as an example for their work. What are you going to do next after Rotterdam? What it will be? I go to Berlin Film Festival and there will be a film I made on the atomic bomb. Hmm. Another story of modernism. Yes, I think it wiped out everything. So for me now, there's not an architectural style anymore that is interesting, but it's pre-war architecture, it's, it's war architecture, and it's post-war architecture, and it's guilt architecture. So, uh, and in this film, you will see that. I mean, it's, uh, it, it goes around the world till to the Northern Mariana Islands where the uh, loading pits of the atomic uh, bombs are still there in an airfield that is now covered by jungle and where the atomic bombs flew off to Japan and this is the, the core of the film. That's why the film is called The Airstrip. Where it started. The horrific well, trip where, where war and where it ended. Yeah. I mean, there's this, uh, the film starts with a kind of ex um, uh, with a kind of text that says there's a very special moment when you drop a bomb between it you dropped it but it didn't hit the earth but what kind of time is that? Is that the future or the past or the present? Because the future the, it can't be the present anymore because it will be destroyed completely in the next moment. And it, so it's a very, it's zero hour somehow. And I think in, in architecture we have something like zero hour too. I mean, most of the Bauhaus architecture looks very fancy and is branded as something very modern, but isn't it, wasn't it a necessity to build these cheap boxes after the war where there was no money to build? Mm -hmm. build better architecture. So, so you are a Bauhaus fan, yeah? I'm no, not I'm not a Bauhaus fan, how dare you? <laughs> no, 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 I was just thinking uh, how, how you would perceive every architecture which is, uh, you know, uh, reflects the here and now. Could it all be called guilt architecture? In not all, no. Why not? <laughs> yeah, <may> <laughs> 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 why not? <laughs> <laughs> there are certain buildings that inherit more that and contain more guilt than others. Some are the very playful and some deal with life without guilt and I envy that. But uh, some people say that we live in an ideology of fear. So, uh, you know, if we agree upon this, you know, every architecture at this very moment. You know. Please do a comparison of your fear with maybe fear of people in the 30s and 40s and you will see that your fear is really small. Are you um, sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Maybe, but 
on the other hand, every fear is the same because it's a, it's a biological mm. thing in your brain. So. But if I compare my fear that I have today with people that might have feared something in, in the last century, I must say, keep your mouth and be not be so fearful because you don't have so much reason for that. Okay, be not fearful. I would say that this is the perfect moment to <laughs> address you and <laughs> ask you, are there any questions to this beautiful man? Yes. <laughs> Could you, I think there's a mic, so. Um. Uh, I wanted to know if you ever consider making a movie about the architecture in Rotterdam. Well, I, I was here, it? yes. It's a very interesting question. It's an amazing city. It was destroyed by the Germans. And there sim seems to be, like, like Gus said, when we came here, he said, they are always continuing building, building, building because they can't stop because it must be a traumata that some, everything was destroyed or to a, to a, a large degree. So that would be something to deal with, like this urge to go on building because in other parts of the world they go do, do, do not go on building, they just use their buildings up till they are gone and then they build something new. But here there seems to be an urge and this, not the buildings themselves would motivate me to do that film, but this urge to go on building. Yeah. Beautiful. A, a little yeah. question, what do you think about the newest Kohlhaas here? I just saw it through the taxi window, so I can't say uh, what I think about it. I okay. <laughs> no architecture criticism in a few words? No, why should I? I mean, I would like to go in, out, and, and before I form my... Uh, no, I'm not so... I'm, n I'm a slow guy, you know. He's not a slow guy. <laughs> he's not yeah. a slow guy at all. <laughs> yes. But maybe he's not looking at architecture through the eyes of the critic. Yeah? Maybe that's the... Yeah. Well, yeah. you see, in Germany, mm. when they want to build a new building, there's so much criticism mm. that I think... They even in, you might know the city of Stuttgart, where they make this whole revolt against building a new train station. And I thought, well, why don't you want to get rid of your Nazi train station, why do you fight for it so much? Let's get a new one. I mean, I don't know whether it's better or not, but let's get first rid of it. Are they in Germany, they built in, in, in Berlin, they built a new city castle, which, is, uh, which was the castle of that fascist Kaiser who, who started to... <laughs> which <laughs> we embraced and gave home in Haus Doren. Yeah, I would s throw a bomb into his okay. place. Uh -huh. but, uh, uh, it's amazing, and they built it on the place of the Palace of the Republic of the German of East Germany, and I think that's an outrage. So, I'm not only for new architecture, but I like to go into the structures, how they, how it comes about, and what it means when you erase something and build something new, and so this kind of totally. Uh, idealized modernism is not my kind cup of, of tea. cup of tea. Yes, yeah. thank you for the word. <laughs> 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 Any other questions? Yeah? Why do you avoid movement by pens or travelers? And Sometimes there are some, but uh, what I like actually is composed imagery. So uh, the you last film, I, I don't know editing, what. Eh? You, you suggest hmm? movement only by editing. Not even. <laughs> yeah, yeah not but even. the last film is only movement. Yeah. Maybe you haven't seen it. No. But uh, the yeah. other films, you are right. There are a lot of architecture films that are shot that are still somehow, but there's only movement within the frame. But I like to compose, to have control of the. F I'm a control freak of the framed image. Yes, I would say. Because it's it's quite uh, remarkable because architecture is about space and space is yeah. ideal for movement. But on the other hand, uh, when you add up, let's say, a, f <laughs> a long film on architecture, it contains of let's say uh, a thousand uh, different shots. So it adds up to your yeah. brain, and you 
recreate the movement yourself. Okay. But, but I think it's so beautiful that he uses, say, this idealistic relationship between architecture and, and, and the camera in a different way in this particular yeah. case. Eh? That, that the uh, eye of the like camera is more about framing than it's about uh, the vista, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Eh? It yeah, and, uh, and, uh, and film is architecture and time, and but then you have to have certain uh, elements and I like to control them and that's why it is. You can't control uh, when, I, sometimes I do tracking, sometimes I do a pen, sometimes I do a, a tracking shot or something. But only when it's really, really necessary. Yeah. And I don't think, and most of the time, it's not necessary. Okay. Mm -hmm. In fact, you said somewhere that you're a little bit irritated by the expressionistic school of uh, with what a certain well, Russian uh, figure This is another point that yeah, moving yeah, yeah. around um. is, is uh, supposed to be a symbol of life or some bullshit like that, and we know exactly. I mean, does a, does, does a building move? Yeah, in earthquakes it does, or when a bomb yeah. explodes, then it moves. But the building doesn't move. You can, you can walk through it and decide, now I want to look at this, and now I want to look, look at, at that. that, and that's what I'm doing. Mm. I'm ex actually documenting my points of view to the build, views to the building. Yeah. yeah, it's about a perspective and not about mm. a language. But I'm grateful for, for that uh, uh, question because it has to be discussed. <laughs> 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 Any other questions which have to be discussed? <laughs> uh, yes, there is. <laughs> um, you briefly alluded to it before, but from your um, making uh, films about uh, architecture in America like Louis Sullivan and the European ones. Could you just offer a few more insights into the uh, similarities or differences in terms of your observation about those perspectives okay. relating, mm. relating to year zero and renewal and all that? Okay, there's a certain group in my films that go back and forth. That's Louis Sullivan, that's Bruce Goff, that's Rudolf Schindler. And you know, there's already the connection. Sullivan, uh, uh, out of Lowe's, went to Chicago, saw the buildings by, by Louis Sullivan. And there's a lot of influence in, in Lowe's work coming from Sullivan. Sullivan. Yeah. Rudolf Schindler was, is a kind of scholar of Rudolf, uh, 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 Rudolf Schindler is a kind of scholar of Lowe's. He went to the States and stayed there and built at the same time as Lowe's built. And when you see my two films on Adolf Lowe's and on Rudolf Schindler, which are not be shown in my so-called retrospective, you will, you will see uh, that the end of it is, I use the same method somehow. I make a catalog of the work, but you see the Rudolf Schindler film has, uh, you feel like uplifted and it's, it's a free work and uh, it's very optimistic and Lowe's is getting more and more enclosed and more and more melancholic and depressed. And that's very interesting. And you see this results in the films. And I think that's very interesting that you can create a form where actually the, the, the architect itself comes through and to you. And so this is a back and forth. And, and, and also in Europe, I mean, he is a fan of Europe, uh, basically, I was for a long time a fan of the United States, and you see in uh, in uh, uh, in Sullivan such a theoretical, beautiful theoretical approach to architecture and architecture and democracy that you can hardly find in European mm. uh, architecture in those times. And then the Europeans came and said the Americans were not able to do architecture theory, and that was, that is just total bullshit. Yeah. Uh, that to make it short, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As a quick follow-up, do you want to comment at all, you said about year zero, that you're thinking about a lot of architecture yes. in Europe, relation uh, to year zero. I'm just interested in America since we were removed, I mean, we had troops that died, but we were removed yes. from the 
Well, I, I worked with a certain group of architects that worked before, almost all of them worked before World War II or uh, in the 50s and 60s. I just did one film with young architects in Austria which is uh, that I filmed in Europe and, and a little outside Europe, which is quite beautiful. But what was your question? Oh, if the idea of year zero that yes, you talked about, yes. if you were applying that mainly to European your uh, description yeah. of European yeah. architects, mm. or if you thought it also... You mean, in, 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 in the States, architecture... Now they have these trophy houses, and they have these trophy uh, skyscrapers, and they have something like Frank Gehry and Saha Hadid. I, would, I wouldn't say she is a European, but I think this is just... Um, not so interesting architecture anymore because it doesn't construct the core. It's more a facade architecture. Mm -hmm. And it really derives from the Bauhaus, school of Bauhaus. I mean, the Which I'm a fan of, by the way. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Can I have one final question? Yeah, please. Because I, I understood that you had uh, an ambition. And the ambition was to make at least three movies a year which I thought was at no, least quite ambitious. No, that's my new ambition. Because it's a new I, ambition. Uh, yeah. It started 10 years ago. <laughs> but uh, before that, I didn't do a film for seven years because I had an editing block. I couldn't, uh, no, not 10 years, like 15 years ago. I had an editing block. I just filmed and uh, for eight years and couldn't finish a film because I didn't know mm -hmm. how to edit Indeed. it. And then suddenly that fell off, and now I continue doing films. And then the last 15 years, I think, this including short films, there are about 70 films now, and which were camp most of them came out of one film idea, and then it was like cell separation yeah, yeah. getting. But that's, of course, the beauty yeah. in yeah. No, also, I think, so like, uh, you are right with these three films, three long feature films. Mm. Everybody, filmmakers, should make three long feature films a year because they don't get better when they make less films. I mean, okay. they, they have to practice filmmaking and all this kind of film funding fuss going around in Europe here where everybody's waiting for money before he gets a new film, and that takes three years to get a film fund together. And it's ridiculous, and the films don't get better by that. I mean, now the techniques, and it's not so expensive anymore to do a film, and we should get rid of that system. Uh, because, you see, you, you see, and then they say, well, let's put all the money into the young filmmakers, and then they get their first film. When it doesn't hold up at the, uh, at the box office, he will never get, or she will never get a chance to do a second film. Look at Fassbinder, he did 30 films before one was good. I mean, this was very interesting. Uh, that there was another period in the 70s and 80s where you could experiment in the public, and now you get punished when you say Please, something. Okay different to the mainstream. Yeah, Again, it's about courage. And you get punished by oh. film critics, too. The most stupid people today are film critics. I mean. <laughs> 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 anyway, yeah. Mr. Uh, Amy Holt. <laughs> no, 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 you're the most stupid. <laughs> hey, thank you very much for this conversation. Yes, I truly enjoyed it. Um, I'm a fan. Okay, <laughs> <thank you. laughs>